Good morning, everyone. Thank you once again for making time out of your day today on December 6th to come on down to be a part of the Rebuild Hawaii Consortium meeting. This is going to be our fourth quarter meeting, the last one for this year. And uh, before we get into a bunch of the intros and really getting into the heart of today's matter, which is looking at energy efficiency from a policy, a financing, and a partnership perspective, um, I just kind of want to get a, a real quick show of hands of the type of audience that we have here. So I'm going to just kind of shout out some sectors or areas. If we can just kind of get an idea of where people are at, it kind of, I think, will help some of the speakers be able to speak to a particular area. So how many energy efficiency project developers or mechanical contractors do we have? Okay. What about renewable energy? Wow, okay, good, good amount there. Business owners? Okay, good, good. Uh, any other types of energy consultants? Good share, okay. Technology vendors? Okay. Uh, state government employees? City and or county employees? Students? All right, educators? Nonprofits? Wonderful. So we got a whole mix of, of everyone here, although it seems that renewable energy, once again, has, seems to have the highest number of hands raised. Um, you know, for those of you who've seen Jay Fidel present, I really like the way he starts things off in a kind of a situation like ours where we get to know one another, even if just for brief moments in time. We're all here to do the same thing, which is to make our islands better. So if we can just take a quick moment to just reach out to the person either on the side of you, in front or behind you, just to introduce yourselves, because again, we're all here to collaborate together. All right, I'm sure if I gave you guys a lot of time, you could go and talk story for quite a bit of time. So we'll go ahead and kind of close it out. Now, I'm sure all of you... Okay, we, we, can, we can run it. I can talk for another one. That's fine. I'm sure all of you have had your first cup and perhaps only cup of delicious Hawaii Convention Center coffee. I hope you guys got the buzz now. Um, what I'm going to do real briefly, again, before we get into things, is kind of give you a heads up on what some of the upcoming energy-related events are in the first quarter. So um, when Michael Chang and I took over and Estrella as officers of Rebuild Hawaii, one of the things we wanted to do was really to elevate the awareness of energy efficiency. And in the past, largely due to budgetary constraints, there's only been able to have four quarterly meetings. What we wanted to do is kind of create more opportunities for you folks to get to know and work with one another outside of these four quarterly meetings. So what we're going to do the first time, I think, in Rebuild History, at least in the 2000s anyways, we're going to have another event outside of the quarterly meeting. So on January 4th, which is a Wednesday, in collaboration with the Institute for Astronomy, Pono Shim folks from Enterprise Honolulu, and Rebuild Hawaii, obviously, and Don Lippert from the Hawaii Renewable Energy Development Venture, on January 4th, we're going to be screening a, a film called The City Dark. For those of you who attended on August 17th at the last Rebuild meeting, we had a discussion at the very end about light pollution. Dr. Wainscote from IFA, Institute for Astronomy, presented. That was basically the catalyst of getting this moving. And Ian Cheney, you guys might know his documentary is called Truck Farm or King Corn, put together this documentary on darkness, on lights, on astronomy. And what it is is really a connecting point of looking at things of energy, human health, our astronomy community, and then obviously efficiency from a lighting perspective as well too. So that's going to be happening at the UH Auditorium at 7 o'clock on January 4th. Again, that's a Wednesday. January 13th is going to be the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum Clean Energy Day at the Capitol. So we will be having a gentleman, Darren Kimura, coming in later in today to speak about that in particular. But just mark your calendar for January 13th. 
um, that's going to be in the morning time down at the Capitol. And there's going to be a pace setters and experts in energy uh, taking place on the third floor concourse in the afternoon, right after lunch. January 18th, for those of you who are involved with the government, obviously you know that's the opening of legislative session 2012. Something definitely for you folks to get involved with as this year, I think is going to be a really potentially challenging year with regards to efficiency and renewables. So it's always good to make sure we come together as a community to support our industry going forward. March 5th is the next rebuild, the first quarter of 2012 consortium meeting. March 7th and 8th is the Hawaii Buildings, Facilities, and Property Management uh, Expo. That's happening out at the Blaisdell on March 7th and 8th. And lastly, April 3rd and 4th, that is uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, is the Building by Green Expo. So a number of things coming up. So just uh, keep it on your calendar there. Now today, again, is December 6th. Tomorrow marks the 70th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And while I wanted to kind of come up here and do something crazy to get things kicked off, because we're really trying to think differently about energy efficiency, I think it takes, it, it's good on us, I think, to step back and kind of look at where we came from and how it all kind of comes and circles back. You know, I'm not a huge historian, but I do enjoy a little bit of history. And if I read history correctly, part of the reason why Pearl Harbor was bombed and the extension of the great coal prosperity plan that the Empire of Japan had back then was because of the lack of natural resources, particularly that of oil. And again, if I understand history correctly, it was the US that actually put an embargo on Japan. And so it is that source of seeking for oil that has sparked wars in the past. And I think if we look at history in recent, even the past couple of decades, I think it's pretty clear to see that going forward, resource wars are probably gonna be the most likely reason for going to battle. So I guess the question becomes, are we doomed to basically repeat history again and again? Can we rethink about the way in which we look at energy and interact with energy and bottom line, use less energy? Basically, that's what we're here to look at and someone to help us really kind of look at things from a different perspective is Sophie from Civil Beat. She's our speaker today to really kick us off thinking differently about how we can look at energy efficiency and more importantly, or at least equally importantly, act differently with regards to energy efficiency. So Sophie, come on and enlighten us. Thanks, Brandon. It's nice to be here today with everyone. Um, I'm a reporter, so usually I spend my days calling people and asking questions and listening to other people speak, uh, talk to me. So this is a role reversal for me. Um, Actually, I see a number of people here today that haven't returned my calls, but <laughs> we can talk after. Uh, energy efficiency has always been the stepchild in Hawaii, and it's pushed for clean energy. It's always lost in the shadows of talk about ocean thermal energy conversion or wave energy or geothermal, huge towering wind turbines. Um, but I think it's one of the most important things that we need to do in terms of moving towards a clean energy future. And I admit that it's more exciting to write about <clears throat> these things, but um, many in the energy sector will tell you that it's critical if we're going to move Hawaii off imported fossil fuels. Um, and I'm sure everyone today is sort of preaching to the choir. Um, I'm sure everyone today is familiar with the arguments of why Hawaii needs to move off of oil. There's the economic insecurity of being almost completely t dependent on a foreign source of fuel that's subject to price volatility due to unrest in the Middle East or trading in oil futures on Wall Street. There, not to mention those that believe we passed the point of peak oil where uh, mining sources of oil is going to be harder and harder and increasingly more expensive. There's a vast economic destruction, uh, environmental destruction uh, not to mention the national security issues that we're facing. Uh, but I'd like to stay focused on what's going on locally here in Hawaii. I get calls all the time from people on the Big Island, Molokai, Lanai, the neighbor islands, uh, people who are really upset about one project or another uh, that's going up in their backyard. Of course, there was the Ainakoa Pono project on the Big Island. Uh, the biofuels plant and the big wind projects that are planned or hoping to go up on Molokai and Lanai. Um, and the overriding sentiment that 
is conveyed to me, and this isn't across the board, but people are really upset on the neighbor islands about the idea of sacrificing their land and their resources for Oahu's electricity needs, which, you know, to put it bluntly, they see as somewhat gluttonous. And I'm not agreeing or disagreeing, but, you know, I'm just the, you know, conveyor of information. <laughs> so I think it's fair to say, um, you know, that if we're going to go with Governor Abercrombie's view of us all being in a canoe together, and rowing towards this clean energy future, that it can't be Oahu sitting in the canoe and the neighbor islands out and back in the water pushing the canoe. Um, so I think, you know, while the neighbor islands are making great strides in switching to renewable energy sources, for instance, the big island is almost 40% renewable energy now, um, Oahu is the tough part. I mean, we have 75% of the population residing here and the least amount of resources. And so I think people at the energy department will tell you that energy efficiency is critical if we're going to meet our goals. Uh, there's the dream of the inner island cable and tapping the neighbor island's energy sources to feed Oahu's electricity needs, but I think as we've seen in the past that these projects are really hard to push through. Um, and I think that's why energy efficiency, even though it gets gets lost in the shadows, it's so important, especially right now. Um, but trying to sell energy efficiency to businesses and residents obviously isn't an easy task. Uh, I, it's not that I don't think people in Hawaii don't support it, I think they overwhelmingly support it. But taking that next step and translating that into having people actually act on it from doing energy audits to switching out their appliances, I think is a much more difficult step even though it makes complete economic sense. Our electricity bills are the highest in the nation, not to mention our gas prices. And so you would think that people would be scrambling to make the switch. Um, it's a big drain on the budgets of businesses and residents, uh, not to mention the overall economy where we have five billion to seven billion uh, annually leaving the state to go to oil. You know, that could be circulated here locally. A recent study by economist James Han Hamilton at the University of California, San Diego, San Diego, that found that spikes in oil prices preceded the, uh, the past 10 out of 11 recessions in this country post-World War II. And I think that's a staggering finding. Um, but here in Hawaii, instead of really understanding that and taking steps to reduce electricity use, um, and prop up our economy, there seems to be this mentality that that's just the price of doing business here uh, in Hawaii. Um, and so I think you know, a lot of people here who are in the industry, it's been your challenge to try to switch that mentality in some way. Um, and so Brandon asked me to speak here today in part, I think, um, about how we can think differently about energy efficiency and act differently when it comes to energy efficiency. And, you know, indeed, Civil Beat, where I work, um, is trying to forge a new business model when it comes to journalism amidst a field where the traditional model has uh, been shaken to its core, le leaving print newspapers scrambling to find something that works economically, financially, for their bottom line. Um, and I'll leave it up to the marketing people to come up with new ways to communicate the message of energy efficiency to the public. But what parallels I may draw uh, from the civil beat model is that you have to think outside of the box. As journalists, we have an amazing swath of tools in front of us thanks to the internet and major technological advances. From social media outlets like Twitter and Facebook uh, to, to technological advances that let you use iPhones to almost instantaneously upload photos and video to the internet. It really is a golden age of communication that we're in right now. Um, but we have to find this way, ways to translate this into a business mod model that works. I think that's very similar to the energy efficiency industry. You can have the most amazing light bulbs and gadgets uh, to help reduce energy use, but if you don't have any buyers or you're not penetrating the market, it's all for naught. So like journalists, you too are in the communications business. And more than ever, success is dependent on your ability to use the multitude of tools in front of you in creative ways to translate your message in ways that are relevant to the public. So in closing, I'd just like to say let's you know, work together in terms of 
uh, getting people to switch out their light bulbs, turn off their air conditioners, and read Civil Beat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sophie. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, our chairman of the House Energy and Environmental Protection Committee, Representative Kaufman, is here joining us. So thank you, <laughs> Representative Kaufman. Also found out that uh, I think we have upwards of 60 or 70 people in the room and apparently close to 225 people online. So over 300 people joining us virtually or in person here today. Um, what I wanted to do next was a part of us sharing information is having more people share information with us. So we have two new affiliates who are joining Rebuild Hawaii. And I'm going to have them come up and do a brief introduction of themselves, their entities, and why they wanted to become a part of Rebuild Hawaii. First, we're going to have Carolyn Wigan Hildebrand from the Research and Statistics Office of the Department of Labor and Industrial Relations. Thanks for making my presentation green today. <laughs> um, I'm Carolyn Wagan, Hildebrand, as uh, introduced, and my little bio, I'm sure you have also put that already in print, but a little thing that I'd like to share if you're wondering about my accent and pronunciation of, the English wor of English words and language, I grew up in Baguio City in the Cordillera region of the Philippines. The reason why I say that, Baguio City is very much like Honolulu, cosmopolitan, and a tourist destination. The Cordillera region is very much like the islands of Hawaii. It has an indigenous population of which I'm part of and very much care about the stewardship of our environment and natural resources and have that special thing called unique culture. So uh, I think I really like this assignment that I had about the green labor market information because of those things that I have that uh, spiritual connection to it. Um, I'm here to, I really, I'm here to say thank you for uh, agreeing uh, and inviting us to speak today and also approving our application to be an affiliate. The Department of Labor and Industrial Relations Research and Statistics Office is an office that is also called the state labor market entity. And uh, labor market is a mouthful, but I think the way people relate to that is every month we uh, release the unemployment rate. And I'm really hoping that it will be up in the, it will, will really uh, go down soon, the unemployment rate, so that they will, people will love us again. Right now they're blaming us for everything else, that we're misjudging it and all that. Um, I'll use this opportunity to actually report about the labor market in information improvement grant and because that is really the formal association of DLIR RNS with the uh, Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative grant. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now what can DLIR RNS do? Uh, you hear us say RNS all the time. Well first workforce development is very important. So much it's even very more important with the clean Work for our uh, clean energy initiative. One, because it's a 2030 goal. We don't really know what's going in there, so we really have to just go in there and try to figure out just like the weather report. We know certain things, we will not know a certain thing. We, we will not know a lot of things, but we still have to prepare for it anyway. And all, I'm sure we all agree that qualified workers at the right time and place is very much needed. And I think RNS will say that labor market information will improve the decision making that we will make along the way as we develop our workforce that is needed. Um, the labor market information improvement grant, as I said, is the formal involvement of the RNS. Um, it, it's also known as the Green Labor Market Grant. It's also known as, it was introduced to the community as the Hawaii Green Jobs Initiative. But the Hawaii Green Jobs Initiative as a DLIR workforce development initiative is broader than labor market. It involves planning that's under the Workforce Development Council. It involves training and the Workforce Development Council and Workforce Development Division takes care of that. It also in involves what we call labor exchange or trying to help people 
get employed, trying to help employers find workers, and also trying to help our special population, the disadvantaged. So that is also under the Workforce Development Division. The RNS just provides the labor market information that will help you know, uh, design training, invest, and all, all that. We also, uh, anyway, I'll talk about it later. Now, I, I like to, sorry that it's so green, but <laughs> I, I, I kind of like to take, uh, I, I kind of like to take us back to the historical involvement of RNS, because it will help us understand where we are at. Um, green labor market information grant really can, has its start, uh, or can be traced back to the 2007 National Green Jobs Act. That was uh, an unfunded mandate of the Congress at the time. At the grassroots level, of course, we, ha we know that uh, folks were telling the legislators what they wanted through the 2015 sustainability plan. And then, of course, in 2008, we have that Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative Agreement. At the time, leaders like Mike Hamnett of the An Energy Policy Forum, Steve Lee of the Strategic Division of DB DBED, and Mike Rota of the, uh, then uh, the vice Vice President for Community Colleges, who's now a Chancellor at HCC. At the time, they put together a Workforce Development Summit, brought in a lot of stakeholders, and said, we really don't know a lot about workforce. So that was the start of that. Workforce development, a green workforce development and sector approach became, uh, was included in the Workforce Strategic Planning of 2009-2014. And so when the Obama Appro uh, approved all the stimulus monies, we were ready to apply for grants, just like everybody else here in Hawaii. So we had, we, we competed for a labor market information grant for, and they gave us 1.25 million for that. And I'm happy to say that I was a co-architect of that one. Uh, that's a one-year grant. It was supposed to end on May 30, 2011, but um, because of all the furloughs and all that, we had justification to extend it up to the end of the month. So I'm basically using this opportunity to, as an annual report. It's sort of an annual report. So what did we accomplish during those first five years, five, uh, to, during the first year? Well, um, how many of you do not know Jeff Matsu by now? Or do you know him? Can I have a raise of hands? Have you listened to his presentations? Well, <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, we, have the, we had this five volume reports. The first report was the most uh, publicized, which has the baseline information about where are the jobs are and who is employing and all that. There was also a projection that's volume two. And then I did the volume three, which is a training gap assessment and exploratory one on how should we start measuring it. And I focused on the construction industry and had all those things. But we had presentations, and the face of the labor market information improvement grant has been Jeff Matsu, who has been going out, presenting what green jobs are, where the green jobs are, and all those nice things. And of course, he has also been getting the heat for whatever we did not do. Uh, right now, he is in Kauai, presenting at an edu energy conference. Oh, one of the things that I'd like to mention here is we have the green portal, www.greenjobshawaii.org. How many more minutes do I have? And that is the one, that, the reason why I'm mentioning that is that is the one that will sustain whatever we are doing after the grant ends this December 30. Um, so during the extension period, we, we, we did not do another baseline study or another data point. We felt that the Bureau of Labor and Statistics Office uh, is already doing a great job at trying to figure out what needs to happen in terms of standardized research, and so they are busy gathering that data right now. What we did instead was to try to address the things that, uh, that uh, people wanted. For example, as soon as we sent out all our research results, they said, we want more information. I think your employer's list is a little bit outdated by now. So our response to that, thanks to the help of Scott Murakami of the community colleges, Workforce Development Director, uh, he's a Workforce Development Director. We were able to partner with Hawaii Information Consortium to put on an online uh, tool for, uh, to, to gather information from the green employers. This will be launched this month. There will be a press release, I believe, about that, and I hope the employers will support it. Uh, this tool will only be as good as the answers of the employers. But I think that the community colleges will like this a lot because I think it will give them information on where the jobs really are. So it will also give them a sense of what training is needed out there. Uh, that's, 
The one that we have been working so hard because we launched the Green Jobs Portal in May 5, uh, last May 5, but uh, the information there really needed a lot of improvement. So we have been spending hours trying to work with our vendors in Florida to improve that Green Jobs ad data. Um, we are proud to say that that has improved a lot, but I am also tell, honest enough to say that we need to improve a lot more. And the improvement is not necessarily only from, it's not only something that the RNS should be doing. It's really trying to involve the entire system to cooperate in trying to improve this system. For example, um, Darren Kimura last October said, I don't find any solar jobs in your job ad list. And, and we went to look for why there is not that. There were so many reasons why there were no jobs there. One, solar industry workers, as our survey says, um, show, that, um, show that they actually use word of mouth. They don't use online. Second, there was some problems in the way our vendor was, uh, was spidering jobs. But anyway, the result of that is because we are trying to improve this, I'm very proud to say that that has improved a lot. But it needs a lot more improvement, so watch out for that. Um, this one's will, we did set out to do a lot of things when we uh, had that grant. We have a B grade as of now based on our stakeholders. Uh, we did ask them what, how we are doing. And so the last one, um, one of the early takes that we had from our conversations with people across the islands is that, yes, your research, please do the research. But yes, you do need to present your research in partnership with others, especially employers. Third, we need to continue creating a new model for researching, which means standardized information and also online resources. And yes, I'm a proponent of accountability, so I hope that uh, all grants that come to Hawaii should need to be uh, evaluated, not only to meet federal requirements, but also our own requirements in Hawaii. And so I am actually here to say, please help us with our research by really supporting all those tools. Tell us what is not working, what, is, what will be working. Thank you, mahalo. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Our next uh, new affiliate, Ken Sheeks, who is the owner and general manager of Hawaii Skylights and Solar Fans. Good morning, everybody. Um, just a quick five-minute overview on uh, daylighting for those of you who don't know too much about it. Uh, now. Uh, it's, it, this is pretty much it. Um, daylighting is just using sunlight instead of electrical light during the day to help you reduce uh, energy costs. Uh, not so practical for high-rise buildings, but for industrial settings and homes and small offices, businesses, warehouses, things like that. It's actually very practical. Um, the type of light that comes through there is very high quality light. Sunlight uh, uh, reflects better. It also brings up uh, attitudes and productivity. And also, uh, there's a few other little tidbits. There's a, they've done a great job, SolarTube's done a great job on um, putting together a lot of facts and figures and case studies as well. Um, with the daylighting systems, typically, whether it's a traditional skylight or a, a tubular skylight, there's very little heat, heat gain or heat loss. So that's very important to keep the loads down on the air conditioning systems and make, make it much more comfortable in the home or the office. Uh, typically, they come in two sizes. There's a, the 10 inch is a small, the smaller size. We typically use those in bathrooms, hallways, closets, things like that. Um, uh, puts out roughly 100 to 150 watts of light, usually. Uh, there's a few accessories that come with that. Dimmer kits for, for turning the light off. Uh, light kits for the, using the same location at night. And ventilation kits for bathrooms. The larger one, the 14 inch, is what we typically use in a kitchen or an office or a workshop or sometimes in several of these in order to bring the light up in the places where you really need it the most. Um, um, since I'm on the homeowner end of it, typically um, most people are looking at just bringing light into, 
into a dark kitchen or, or someplace like that to just make it a nicer place to live. The byproduct of that is the energy savings. So this is what you do when you really love your reef and you have way too much time on your hands. <laughs> I just like that one. Sorry. Uh, in the commercial settings, uh, REI, my favorite store on the whole planet, um, uses these in a lot of their locations. They typically have two-story um, retail shops and the upper floor is usually pretty well lit with uh, daylighting devices. Um, they realize quite, uh, quite a healthy savings and their, um, the part that's not on here is the return on their investment was recaptured somewhere between four and five years out, so not too bad. A little bit more expensive to put them on the commercial buildings than it is on residential. Um, homeowners typically payback time is three years plus or minus one, typically on, uh, depending on the usage and the room that it's put in. Uh, a lot of creative places they put these in. This is one of the venues that, uh, that was used during the Beijing Olympics. The other place uh, is the, the water cube. I think it had 60 or 70 uh, of the larger 21 inch uh, daylighting devices. Uh, just, a few, just a few little slides on locations, uh, kitchens. I think typically we do kitchens most, bathrooms are second, hallways, closets, offices, run right after that. So just a few uh, slides on applications. Um, the carbon emissions is, is great too. There's a little offset. Not that this is all that important to a homeowner, but for, the, for those of you that are thinking about using this in business, uh, this can be one of the bullet points on your, on your presentation. Um, of course, these are mainland electric uh, electric rates on here, so you can you can make an adjustment from that. But as far as I know, they use typically about 11 or 12 cents per kilowatt hour to do the these calculations as as the average across uh, at least the southern U.S. Uh, what does daylighting do for the the homeowner? It increases the the value. It makes it brighter. Um, homes typically sell faster, and um, um, it seems like the the green homes, you know, solar panels, solar water heaters, whatever you can do to make the home green, is more appealing to to the new to the next home buyer. Uh, some of the benefits of of daylighting, obviously, there's some health in health benefits as well. The full spectrum of light seems to uh, improve moods, uh, increase productivity in workplaces. Um, when they put these in schools, the test scores seem to go up. And it's not just by a slight margin, it's actually uh, pretty significant. Um, and I can get all the case studies on those if anybody's interested. Uh, this is kind of a busy slide, so I'll go through it pretty fast. Uh, Per square inch, tubular skylights put out about four or five times as much. I think it's four times as much light as a traditional skylight. These install in about two hours, where a typical or a traditional skylight might take um, might take a craftsman two to three days with the whole process of cutting through the roof, flashing it, redoing the drywall on the inside, texturing and painting. Um, these all come with a come out of a leak-free design. Um, all the flashings are seamless, and all the, they're all round so that the water sheds off beautifully, and they come with a pretty healthy warranty. Uh, there's never any re-roofing or reframing required. These go in. Typically, it's easier to put these in after the house is built rather than during. Um, the, there's obviously no drywall, no painting. And the best part about this type of skylight is the, the diffuse light that comes out of it spreads throughout the whole room. Whereas on a traditional skylight, typically you have that big glass pane or the, or the acrylic dome on there and you, you can pretty much watch in a, a rectangle moving across the floor throughout the day as the sun goes overhead. And this puts out a very consistent amount of light throughout the day. You know, typically you can barely tell the difference between eight o'clock in the morning, noon, and four o'clock in the afternoon. 
Uh, the cost is significantly less, mostly due to the labor cost. Uh, parts costs are about the same, but with it only taking about two, or two hours to put in, it goes pretty quickly. Um, these are Energy Star rated. The federal tax credit disappears at the end of this year. So I'll be knocking on Hawaii Energy's door to see if I can pry a rebate out of them. Uh, just a few before and after pictures. Um, these are really unretouched. If you took the time to look, uh, you could see the shadows from the counter and so on. There's no theatrical lighting. This is actually uh, how it looks when you're all done. There's a few of my customers in the room. I'm sure they can attest to that. Um, now this one, this slide intrigues me. It kind of looks like that tub would fit in that little socket in the wall. So I kind of wonder if somewhere out there somebody's got a Murphy tub instead of a Murphy bed. And if they do, I'm going to find it and I'm going to put it in the next house. Because how often do you really use a tub? Anyway, we do free and home consultations. Uh, we're all factory trained. And we have uh, quite an, uh, the company has quite a bit of experience. This is the Solotube's 20th year in business. And all the installations are warrantied leak free for five years or more. Um, here's our contact information. And the last thing I really wanted to say was that the last time I looked at Hawaii Energy's pie chart on electrical use, lighting, lighting consumes about 8% of our electrical use throughout uh, I think the residential side of it. That's really, it may seem like a small sliver, but if you use daylighting instead of electrical lighting, that's one easy way, very inexpensive, fast way to reduce energy use. Um, and anyway, thank you very much for your time. All right, where we're going to take things now is the beginning of the first session. As you recall, today's main chunk of what we're here to look at is really three perspectives. Energy efficiency when looking at it from a partnership perspective, a financing perspective, and of course, a policy perspective. So, you know, Sophie touched upon some things there, talking about thinking outside the box. And that's really what this partnership session is all about, is first and foremost, before you can think outside the box, you have to understand what the constraints and limitations of those boxes are. And some of these speakers today will be kind of talking about some of that and then taking it to the next level. Just want to share a quick quote with you from someone who I think encapsulated what we're talking about here. This is coming from the senior VP of Best Buy by the name of Neil McPhail. He wrote, where ideas and passions come together, there's an opportunity for leadership and entrepreneurship to step forward with new business models and new solutions that can help accelerate the opportunities around energy efficiency. Our next three panels who will be coming up here in just a moment are going to be moderated by Robin Campaniano. I don't think Robin needs much of an introduction, but he is the general partner of Ulupono Initiative and essentially spends the vast majority of his waking hours trying to find ways of strategic partnering through investments with nonprofits and for-profit entities. And uh, he'll be leading this group. And if we can have the three speakers come up here, we have Michael Chang from Hawaii Energy, Sean Conley from KOA Sustainability Studio, and Rob Kinslow from the Hawaii Interfaith Power and Light. One quick thing just want to share with Robin, because he's not all work and no play. Yeah. Robin shared with me, because Ulupono obviously is focusing on not just energy, but food security mm -hmm. as well, too. I found out from Robin that if you put a ulu or bread food inside the microwave for 15, 20 minutes or so, you get this delicious custard-like creamy dessert. So that doesn't relate to energy, but it's all good. So Robin, it's all you. Well, Brandon, there is an energy component since you, are, you have to use a microwave heat on high. Um, <clears throat> good, <clears throat> good morning. I'm delighted and really excited to, to be here in front of you, and I hope to learn uh, and, and share some knowledge uh, with this delightful panel. And I think what we want to do is we want to have a little bit of an inquiry, a little understanding of what we do collectively, uh, what we should be doing, and we want to build a foundation for the uh, later sessions today on financing and policy. Now, while my observation is that this is an extremely knowledgeable and sophisticated audience, and 
my other observation is Hawaii is generally moving forward um, in, in trying to get more local food, you know, part of what we try to do, and also understanding the concept of why uh, energy, um, renewable energy is, is so important. But I've also noticed that there was a skepticism, a deep skepticism within our community, uh, despite the fact that uh, signs point towards global climate change, uh, despite the fact that energy prices uh, still rise, uh, there's a reluctance to embrace uh, uh, technologies, ideas, concepts that would help us um, protect against uh, what, you know, uh, high prices of gas, uh, high prices of oil. There seems to be a broad acceptance that this is the way things are, are going to happen. Um, and while efficiency is good, um, I hear more lip service given to uh -huh. these concepts as well. So I think one of the things um, that we will challenge um, our collective thought processes, certainly for this panel and beyond, is what can we do collectively to really bring the concept of energy efficiency to the forefront of our, our of, of Hawaii's minds? You know, what dawned on me earlier this year is um, in January, I recall receiving a Department of Defense briefing, um, which suggested that, uh, and this is DOD, they have nothing to do with uh, the, the, the way the state is run, um, but the, the Department of Defense um, study suggested that if oil prices hit $100 a barrel, uh, they saw a very ominous, ominous economy for the balance of the year. Now, recall this is probably written in December when oil prices were in the, in the low 90s. About a month or two after that, um, Fukushima hit. And I think some of us were very concerned because of the, dr the drain of not only tourists that uh, would come from Japan, but also the increasing cost of energy um, in, in anticipation of Japan turning off the reactors and driving up the, the price of oil. Um, about the week of APEC, uh, received a briefing from HECO, which suggested that they were buying spot oil for $132 a barrel. That indeed, Fukushima had caused a drain on national, uh, na uh, international resources, and Hawaii, as a small spot buyer, um, was forced to buy, not at the Costco rate, but as a neighborhood drugstore rate, um, $132 a barrel. Let me give you another figure that's startling. The cost that HECO had uh, suggested back in 2009 about the break-even point for bringing in the 200 megawatts of wind from Molokai, 200 megawatts of wind from Lanai, the break-even point was $108. So when we look at what's happening globally, um, we're subject to the whims and caprices uh, of the international market. And as we look forward to uh, the situation not getting any better, what then are we going to do? Well, certainly, our policymakers have, over the last few years, tried to, you know, tried to attack this, tried to address this. When we go back to one of the f hopefully operative, informative documents that govern state policy, it's the 2050 plan. And that plan clearly states as part of its, of its objective, energy efficiency. More specifically, you know, we've all talked about the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative and, and noticed that the state's energy efficiency portfolio standard calls for a reduction of, of 30 percent. I think we're all fairly well versed in that. So that's, if I recall, something on the order of 4,000 gigawatts um, by 2030. Uh, you know, I'm not a mathematician, not an engineer, but that's a whole lot of gigawatts. And from my way of looking at it, uh, we're not going to accomplish that by just turning off the lights when we leave the room. There has to be some massive, massive systemic change that will bring this about. So what we're going to do, though, is we're going to hear from some very novel and creative uh, enterprises that are actually addressing um, energy efficiency uh, as we speak. Uh, Sean Connolly um, from the KSA Sustainability Studio will talk about Carrot Mob. Great concept, great opportunity, and perhaps a way where we can get the community as a whole to embrace uh, um, energy efficiency. Uh, Rob Kinslow, Hawaii Interfaith Power and Light, will tell us about religious partnerships and, and the fascinating work he's done. Um, well, Hawaii Inter um, the Interfaith Power and Light does focus on global warming as a whole, uh, but in Hawaii, they've taken on a new and pretty invigorating initiative as well. And Michael Chang from Hawaii Energy uh, will tell us about community partnerships and the great work that they do. Now, the context within which we'll operate is Brandon's been very good. He's been a very 
strong taskmaster, and he's been enamored with the Japanese concept of Pechakucha. Um, so what we'll see is a slide deck of hopefully no more than 20 slides from each individual and uh, no more than a 10-minute presentation. And hopefully that allow us some time for the panel to engage amongst themselves and for you to ask questions and answers. So without delay, uh, bring up Sean. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, thank you for having me here. I'm Sean Connolly. I'm here on behalf of my team, the KYA Sustainability Studio. You probably know my team members, Tamara Armstrong, Vance Arakaki, and Amy Brinker. We're a local innovation firm in McCulley, and we specialize in all things sustainable from business to building. And today, I'm gonna to be sharing a story about a creative way to help local businesses fund sustainability. And as a young professional, I think we're in a very interesting time in terms of the sustainability movement because studying this for about 10 years ago, you could say the word sustainability and you'd get kind of blank stares, question marks. But today you say the word sustainability and at least there's a general understanding that okay, sustainability equals going green and that may mean different things for different people. So we're at this point where we have the general understanding, we have educational programs developing and we also have the technology necessary um, to help us lower ecological footprints. So it's a really exciting time, and what we really need now are the collaborative programs, partnerships, and services to help Im implement those things. So I'm gonna actually fast forward now to the end of my story and tell you that in partnership with e Energy Industries, shout out to Brandon and Malia, um, with Hawaii Energy, uh, shout out to Michael and Malama, um, Mobi PCS, and the support of Kanu Hawaii, um, Malama Hawaii, and the Blue Planet Foundation, KYA was able to help the wine stop generate $6,912.43 in four hours. And that's over 460% of their average cost or what they make during that time. And it's really incredible. And what makes it incredible is that it was easy, it was fun, and it's replicable. So this is the simple answer, which is consumer purchasing power. And I have to give credit to my close friend, Irene McClintock at the Blue Planet Foundation for initially planting the seed in my mind of this thing called a carrot mob. So carrot mob, what is that? Basically, a carrot mob is an organized community that comes to support a business um, trying to do something good for the environment. And it comes from the expression carrot or stick, which you're probably familiar with. The idea of carrot, which are rewards, versus stick punishment. So you have the image of a horse. You can either lead by giving the carrot or punishing them. And the idea of a carrot mob is that it's a better situation if you reward a business for doing good behavior versus punishing them. Because when you punish them, let's say through a boycott, for small businesses especially, it actually is a lose-lose situation. So what we want to create is a win-win situation. And right around the same time that I was learning about that concept, um, I was also hanging out with uh, my friends at the wine stop. I went to school at Castle High School with the bookkeeper of the store. And I really love the wine stop because it's a locally owned business. The owner, Leanne Fu, went to Kamehameha Schools. She's Hawaiian. Um, they started the store about eight years ago um, through community-based economic development fund. Um, and it's really an example of a vibrant, the kind of stores that make neighborhoods vibrant. And they're telling me, oh, it's really hard this year. We can really feel the economy. Um, people aren't coming to shop as much anymore because why alcohol is basically luxury. Um, and I'm looking around their store and looking at their fluorescent bulbs, their incandescent bulbs, and I ask them, well, have you considered doing some energy retrofits to reduce your overhead? That way you can, you know, at least during this hard time, start saving money. And they're, they're like, oh yeah, that sounds good in theory, but we don't have the money to do that. So then I propose the idea of the carrot mob to them and position in a way where it becomes more than just an energy, energy retrofit, but it's about building a partnership with their community um, in a way that gives their community ownership over the improvements that the store becomes. So we come up with this idea, you know, take responsible drinking to the next level and help the wine stop become more sustainable. Um, and really using this idea of energy efficiency as a first step towards becoming sustainable. So it really becomes their, their entry point because it's the lowest hanging fruit they can um, get the quickest payback on, on those retrofits. And so 
it comes into fruition, Carrot Mob Hawaii, and we immediately start partnering with our closest affiliates. We talk to Energy Industries, who provides an energy audit and an assessment. We talk to Mobi PSCS, who helps with the promotion and gives us a raffle prize. And um, we talk to Hawaii Energy. They, they came to us and through their LED program to give, give out LED lights during the event. And these are just some pictures of some of the things that we're assessing. You know, the fluorescent light bulbs in their walk-in refrigeration, the mechanical equipments, the incandescent bulbs, and um, kind of this poor lighting situation that can use a lot of improvement. And through the energy audit that Energy Industries provided, we find that we can save at least you know, close to $4,000 a year, which is a 1.6 year payback, and the owner of the store loves that. She's really excited. Some things that we were wanting to look at but we weren't able to get to were retrofitting their AC system, which is kind of a, a larger investment, and then also the potential of putting in solar power. We looked at a power purchase agreement, but the store is just too small for um, the commercial industry to viably finance that currently. Um, we get a lot of press, we go into Facebook, we utilize all of our social media to advertise the event. Um, we have it published in the weekly Honolulu Business Magazine. We really build this nice hype, um, all just through word of mouth. And what was really great is that the workers of the store really took ownership of this initiative. They went from just being, oh yeah, I work at the wine stop, to oh, I'm gonna help make the wine stop more sustainable. They took the initiative, and um, this is not with e this is not through the owner's direction. This is all self-directed from the employees. They cut out the logo, made little tags. They doubled their, um, or actually they tripled their intake of biodynamic wines. They tagged it all, um, and then the day of, through the day of the event, we went and marked all of the items that would be changed out. Um, they had uh, or free organic wine tasting. A lot of people were there talking story, talking about energy efficiency. And it was a really beautiful thing to see um, the people come together to help make the wine stop a better place. We had um, our carrot mascot out front, uh, <laughs> uh, recruiting people from the street, telling them about the event. And it was just a lot of good energy around. You can see um, at, the, at the event, we started painting size, saying things like buy wine, save energy. Um, use the carrot, not the stick kind of idea. Um, and then over the course of the day, you know, filled in how much money we were making. And what was really amazing is that their average income is about $1,500. And we were able to um, cap that within the first. Um, so it was just an amazing thing. And Um, to see the community coming together. So again, overall, this idea of Carrot Mob was really amazing because it was an example of a really dynamic and rich partnership between our company and a local business who was our neighbor, um, other businesses, affiliate, and then really the community coming together and um, using their, their money as, as a voice to say, yes, we wanna support you if you're becoming sustainable. So with that said, we would also like to make a special announcement for announcement for next carrot mob. So we have here Julie and the carrot coming. <laughs> Great job, John. Thank you to everybody who came out to support the carrot mob before. We had a wonderful time, and I'll be there again um, this Saturday at the Hawaii Kai Shopping Center at Kale's. We're gonna be working with Kanu Hawaii for their zero waste challenge, I'm sorry, um, uh, uh, waste challenge, and we're gonna be supporting a recycling program infrastructure over at the Hawaii Kai Shopping Center. So we'll see you out there. Again, that's this Saturday at Hawaii Kai Shopping Center. So yes, if you have any more questions or would like to just talk story about what we do as an innovation firm, you're welcome to check out our website at www.thekyastudio.com or you can also give us a call 949-7770 and set up an appointment to come talk story with us at lunch. We would love to have you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank Brandon for inviting me. I really appreciate that, and Elizabeth for setting up this organization, Rebuild Hawaii, which I think is 
going to be exactly what I'm going to be talking about a little bit today is this for the development of this fourth sector. Um, my name is Rob Kinslow and I'm the uh, executive director of the Hawaii Interfaith Power and Light. And I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But let me uh, continue today. I'm going to talk about partnership in the canoe. And I think this metaphor of the canoe is a really important uh, metaphor to understand our current situation and to help us uh, move forward with our complex uh, world that we have. I'm going to be talking about a little bit about partnership uh, as economics or economics as partnership. And uh, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about my organization. And then we're going to talk about some lessons learned and some recommendations. So I wanted to start off with this slide here. And I'm going to get this presenter's neck because I don't have a monitor out here. Uh, I'm going to be turning. Uh, to the side. I, I had a script because Brandon was like really Nazi with me on the phone about timing, but I'm just going to abandon the script and uh, talk to you uh, contemporaneously. But I really think that what we need is new eyes. We need to see ourselves differently. We need to think differently. We need to act differently. And, and this is really the essence of what Hawaii Interfaith Power and Light uh, tries to encourage uh, the faith community to do. And so Marcel Proust, you know, it's not about taking a step, although it's about that as well. It's also about seeing where you're going and having new eyes about what, uh, of what is the vision. And so how do we move towards sustainability? What is sustainability? And, um, you know, this is a standard definition of sustainability from the Brundtland Commission, but this slide has been acting up ever since I uh, uh, created it. But we have two types of sustainability. We have weak sustainability, which is what we currently practice, and we have strong sustainability. And the difference between the two is that currently we hold, in our economic system, we hold uh, the total amount of capital, natural and human, constant. At least that's what we think we do. Because, because uh, today we can see that, and I'm going to show this a little more visually later, that humans have increased and nature has decreased. But yet in strong sustainability, what we do is we hold total capital, uh, holds natural capital constant because natural capital is, upon, is the basis upon which we, uh, the human life depends. And so our neoclassical economic system is this model. This is the visual model of our neoclassical system. And it's a simple circulatory flow that's isolated from everything else. There's no humans in it. There's no nature in it. There, it's just a simple circulatory flow between goods and services and factors of production. And that's really an old model that belongs in the 18th century, which is where it began. And some of the uh, cons that, that this uh, model have is that uh, there's no limits. There's no considered, there's no limits to human growth. And there's no scale. How do we determine the scale of our economy? I mean, our economic system is really a system of partnership agreements between, our, uh, between us. And so we need to really understand how are we going to be partners in this canoe? And so the vision that this uh, economic system came from was of an empty world, a world that only had, was empty of humans, but lots of nature. And so things seemed unlimited, and we didn't need to seem to care about whether or not we have nature to provide ecosystem services for us. And so here is that empty world. Let me back up one sl slide. This is that empty world. And you can imagine being in this empty world and seeing around you the beautiful nature and the richness and abundance and the ecosystem services that were provided by nature were all around us and very apparent. And yet, what we've gotten to today is, or, or what we had then was a, a, a large world and a small economy with a small amount of people. And today, what we're coming to is a full world. And this is the essence of the problem, is a problem of scale of our economy. Our economy is heavy in our canoe today, and we can see that. And so what we have today is we have a bunch of people and a big economy. And now whether that economy is based on paper or whether it's based on you know, assets, it's a different story. But the effect, the footprint, 
if you would audit the economy, <laughs> the footprint of the economy would be very big today. The footprint of humans is very big today. And so, we, but we're still using the same economics. We're still having the same partnership agreements in, on this canoe. And so, let's look at this a different way. Let's look at it in terms of footprint. This is, every year, the Global Footprint Network calculates the day at which the supply-demand curve, the supply that the Earth provides of ecosystem services, and the demands that humans put on it, uh, that day every year in which humans use up the ability of the Earth to regenerate ecosystem services gets earlier and earlier. And this year that day was September 27th, I believe. And so what has happened is that we're in ecological debt. About 30, up until about 30 years ago, we were below. Every year we would be, use up the amount of ecosystem services that was and that amount would be below the level uh, that the nature is able to regenerate every year. But about 30 years ago, 35 years ago, we crossed that threshold. And here, we're way up here, we're in ecological debt. Just like we're in economic debt. And the reason that we're in ecological debt is because we're in economic debt. Because ecologics and economics are exactly the same. The ecological relationship that we have with the planet is the same as the economic relationship. The way we treat each other is exactly the way we treat the planet. And this is called a new branch of economics called ecological economics. And so I'm, this is the first time I'm giving this presentation because I'm studying ecological economics at HPU and my sustainable development uh, uh, masters. So I just want, it, it fits so well with this idea of partnership in the canoe. And especially in Hawaii, this type of economics that we have, we have an, uh, an opportunity to change our economics a little bit more, we have a little bit more freedom to do that. And it's a little, lot more apparent what we need to do. And this is another way of looking at it. This is GNP versus time. And you can see that way back here when we had an empty world, back here at this axis crossing here, where there was an empty world, a lot of nature, a lot of ecosystem services could be provided, and a little bit of human capital. A lot of natural capital, a little bit of human capital. And today, we're way out here, and we've really just exterminated nature and built humans, uh, human capital. So this is human capital. All under the area under the curve here is human capital. The area above the curve is natural capital. And this is just another way of looking at it. And this is reality. This isn't something that I'm making up. This is the way scientists and economists who study these things see this. And so this is kind of typical language from the ecological economics. When natural capital was abundant, the human capital was scarce. We could consume natural capital. And that's where our economics came from. That's why it's a circulatory model and not a digestive model. But today, we have a lot of human capital, a lot of labor, and we need to make that labor, put that labor in service to the natural capital restoration. So what are, where are we? And so this brings up another point uh, called adaptation. How do we adapt to this reality, this new eco economics? And, 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 and this chart here looks at the carrying capacity of the earth, and basically there's two types of population growths in, on the planet. There's this R-rated population growth, like rabbits, that goes up and it passes the carrying capacity of the planet, and then it crashes. And then there's this other type of uh, biological growth that also goes up uh, exponentially, but levels out. And the question is, which one are humans? Which one are we? We just passed seven billion humans on the planet this, pa this month. Our footprint is amazingly huge. And just like the algae in the pond, where the, ne the last day, the pond looks half empty. That's where we are today. We have to decide, we have to decide what is our partnerships gonna look like in the future. And I think this type of grouping of people where we have business, civil, and nonprofits together, maybe a lot less nonprofits than business and government, um, it, but necessarily, we need more of that. And so I suggest that we need an economic plimsoll line. Now, what is a plimsoll line? 
Well, Plimsoll line is the side of, is a mark painted on the side of a boat that tells you how much you can load the boat to. And if our boat is a canoe, if the earth is a canoe, we need an economic Plimsoll line to tell us how big can our economy be, what's the scale of our economy, and our current economic system does not do that. It only uh, focuses on allocation. And so it doesn't answer any of the questions that are relevant to a full world. And these questions are, how big is the economic subsystem relative to our canoe? How big can it be without sinking our canoe? And how big should it be to optimize life in the canoe? And the, and the, and the operating phrase there is optimize life in the canoe. And these are important questions that we need to ask ourselves. And I think that energy efficiency, conservation, and renewables are trying to address. But we're coming at it from an action standpoint where I'm saying is let's figure out what the carrying capacity of the islands are. What are the carrying capacity of the islands, the biological and the, and the uh, human carrying capacity? So we need a policy instrument to limit the scale of the economy. That doesn't mean that we're not going to have a good economy or a good partnership agreements or going to have a good way of life. It just means that we have to think about the footprint of our economy. So this is the slide I thought we were on last time. Uh, the, so I'm going to now say, how do we adapt? What do we have to do to adapt? Well, let's, let's look at what's happening. We have uh, natural processes and change occurring at exponential rates. I mean, everybody agrees that time is speeding up and that th change is coming in a much, much faster way. And yet, our institutional responses are linear. Now, there's no way that we're going to keep up with change that's exponential with a linear response. And institutions need to learn how to respond in a different way. And that's a, an adaptive strategy that I think this group of people somehow will come together and, and uh, manifest. So what are partnership economics? If we just simply did these four things here, we just simply did these four things, we would have a lot different canoe, a lot better relationships in the canoe. If we just realize the economy is a subset of the environment, that growth in population consumption levels is not sustainable. Growth, the emphasis is on growth, not development. That's the difference between industrial econ economics and sustainable development is that we're focused on development. After all, development can be infinite. I mean, we all have a potential to be infinitely much more improved. We have so much work to do in the environment out there to restore the ecosystem services. We could spend the rest of our lives and all of our labor doing work in the environment to restore the ecosystem services. Just the fact of pollinators, just losing pollinators in our environment is one thing that we could do to restore uh, sustainability. Uh, renewable resources must be harvested at less than the rate of natural replenishment. Well, that's friggin, I'm sorry to say that's really common sense, but our economics doesn't do that. We don't do that. And non-renewable resources must be recycled. Use must decline because, after all, we only have a limited amount of them. We use a whole bunch of them up already. And that's conservation and energy efficiency. So this is really the, the, the point of my uh, presentation. We have these three sectors of society, civil, business, and government. And government and business has done a really good job of working together. But they've left the civil society out, in my view. And indeed, that's what you see you know, with Occupy Wall Street. You see that the civil society thinks that they're not part of, of the partnership. And so there's this fourth sector that Elizabeth and I believe that Rebuild Hawaii is an is a integral part of, of developing. And that's this partnership between civil business and government, between nonprofits who are really out in the world doing the development work that um, we need for sustainability. And that's what HIPL is about. HIPL is an interfaith nonprofit that works at the a nexus of churches and civil society, and it works with partnerships. And our, mo our mantra is to be faithful stewards of creation or encourage faithful stewardship 
energy conservation, efficiency, and renewables. So that's how that's we work with churches to remind them that their central message is stewardship. Okay, I'm almost done. So uh, this is the Interfaith Power and Light, a little bit of history. It started in 1996, and now we were formed in 2007. We're a partnership between Interfaith Alliance of Hawaii and the three of us, the national organization and the local organizations, all work together as one. Um, we are 38 IPLs now in 38 states. Each state has an IPL, and we have over 14,000 congregations with uh, appropriate case studies and, and all. We keep just getting bigger and bigger every, every year. We've done a lot of work in Hawaii with partners, and so I think we're, we're trying our best to, to be good partners and work with partners. Most of these are uh, community projects. Uh, some of them are businesses. A few of them are businesses. But we clearly have a lot more opportunity to work with those of you who are in the room. Um, so we need room for improvement. But so we've gone out, and our par basic partnership approach has been to say, how can we work together? And or to say, let's work together. <laughs> and so some of the responses we got was, you can make a lot of money if you sold your database to us. You know, give us access to your members, we'll give you a certain percentage. Uh, other people took our ideas and then proposed them back to us as their ideas. Um, other people have taken a strategic approaches and done other things with them. But my point is, is that this approach, which is a kind of a predatory approach, but it's, it's kind of standard operating procedure for Business, business. I'm not criticizing it. It's just the way our economics is. We need to change that a little bit. We can't be that way with each other. We have to be more collaborative. We need to think about mutual benefit. What is our mutual benefit? What is collaboration? And so the lessons we've learned from this, what we've taken away, is that, hey, there's a lot more that can be done in the government and business sectors to learn from community development uh, approaches. I mean, this carrot mob idea is a great creative idea that government and business can use. Uh, business can adapt on a, a collaborative approach. There's more collaboration, more improvement for collaboration in business. Um, Faith-based relationships require additional trust building. It, it's, it's actually a, a fairly difficult uh, um, proposition. We, there's a lot of work to be done in the faith-based uh, arena. And, you know, sometimes when it comes to solar, PPAs aren't the thing for churches. And we need more relationship building in the canoe. So I urge you to take a look at uh, the Earth Charter. And that really encapsulates, I think, the philosophy of partnership in the canoe. And if you'd like to read some of the books that have influenced me recently, I'd urge you to read some of these books here. Thank you. It's opening up. Um, Michael Chang uh, with Hawaii Energy, and a uh, couple things we'll address first. Ken, anytime you need the incentives, bring it down. We're ready for you. All right, it's that one. Um, and actually, it's interesting. Um, Brandon has uh, sent us a lot of emails prepping us for this meeting, and he's been very uh, giving us a lot of quotes. I see a lot of people use quotes, so I did too. Uh, we've got the 20 slides, and um, talking about the the new eyes uh, thing. I think that's one thing that will be kind of a theme on this. And while I gave my time there, I got it open. Good. All right, so let's find the automated. Oh, it saved it as a PowerPoint. That's good. Far left. There it is. All right. So that's us, Hawaii Energy. Um, we're the state's efficiency program. Uh, we have takes care of all the islands except for Kauai. KIUC has their own programs. I'm not sure if there are KIC people are here, or they might be on the television. Um, so they actually have programs too. So anything that you see on our site, um, you know, also we work with them as far as you know sharing ideas and that kind of thing. So. Don't uh, leave out our buddies over there. So here it is. I've got 20 seconds for this slide. How many energy efficiency experts does it take to change a light bulb? Show of hands. Come on. Come on. Somebody volunteer. 
Oh, there's one way up there. How many? Just one. Just one. Okay. Anybody else? Any other answers? Just one? We got a lot of ones in here. All right, just one. Okay. Well, it depends on how big the light bulb is. <laughs> is Glenn here today? No? That's a 50,000 watt GE light bulb. Wow. The world's largest light bulb. So it depends on how big the light bulb is, or how big the projects are, or how complex, or how, there's a lot of things. But the theme of this thing is going to be how many people does it change the light bulb, okay? So that's going to go on. So the first one I'm going to add in here uh, is a quote, progress is not created by contented people. So talking about these people, how many of these people will it take to change the light bulb? How many people are there in the state of Hawaii? A, hundred, a million people? One point something million people? 1.3 million. How many people have electric bills? That's a good question. 400,000. Who said that? Okay, Mr. Ken. Very good. 400,000 residential customers. See, he does his research how many solar tubes he can sell. 400,000 times a few. <laughs> times four. Okay, so he can sell 1.6 uh, million um, things. So these are them. These are the 402,000 Schedule R customers. Guys on the far right use over 2,000 2, kWh per month. Ken, that's your customers on that side. Uh, you got customers on this side, and the great majority of them actually only use about three to 400 kWh per month, okay? So that's kind of the distribution of people. So one, at least 400,000 to change some light bulbs here in Hawaii. And commercial properties. Again, talking about partnerships, one, we have the residential sector and we have the commercial sector. And one thing that we've been trying to do lately is combine the two. And so in every business, who works there? People. And so a lot of times it was commercial, take care of the chillers, take care of their big stuff. But guess what? Some of the people have a lot of employees, government employees. How many are there? Half of them. Um, and then the, the other half is like Sheraton. Guess how many employees Sheraton has? Thousands. And so what we've done really is, is work with their staff to not only get the idea that at the work you're gonna be energy efficient and think about it, but at home also. So part of our team has been down there during their lunch hours, going through all the shifts, listening to and, and um, describing the kind of programs that are available, both at their home and also in the business. So again, there's commercial people and residential people. All right, do I got 20 seconds? I'm beating the 20 seconds right now, I better slow down. Okay, now what, who are these people? Your future depends on many things, but mostly you. What kind of, what kind of organizations say that a lot? I look, just looked at him. Oh, come on. Huh? All of, All of you. All right. This is the choir. Grassroots sustainability organizations, then that is their message. Their message is it takes you. It takes change. It takes, you know, the individual to do something different. So we've got a, peop a lot of um, organizations here that we've worked with. And the idea here is, again, the fresh eyes. We talk about, you know, what we've changed. We've been in the business here, taking over the programs for about two years. When we first got here, you know, we started to work with some of the or grassroots organizations and they were starting to do some of their things while we were doing ours. We kind of concentrated on just getting the programs running. But what happened in over two years, we've all grown together. We've grown as far as the ideas that they've had. They've grown in the ability to execute. We've grown in ourselves as far as concentrating on money for stuff and then also now concentrating on how to get people to do the things. So we've all grown together and these are some organizations. So I say more coming soon, but also more creatively. I think you see the carrot mob thing. That was an example of, of social media. Actually, it was Sean uh, texting, I think, Megan to say, hey, this is going on, and them going, hey, how can you help? And you know, three days later, it's, it's all going. And so it doesn't take a lot of time sometimes. It just takes the idea to start flowing. All right, so the next group. Wisdom isn't the acquisition of knowledge. It's knowing which knowledge is worth acquiring. What kind of groups would that be? To change the light bulb, remember? Get the theme going. We just had a presentation by one of them, DLIR. Their job, help educate, train workforce. So it's education and workforce development experts, okay? K through 12 education programs, um, you haven't seen a lot of it yet because we've just started them, but there are programs right now that we're uh, basically sponsoring. The commission has recognized that not everything in the efficiency program is going to actually achieve KWH in that first year you do it. Every dollar we spend may not necessarily bring KWH in that first year, but there's a high expectation if you do it right with education and training that those KWHs will appear very soon. And so K through 12 education programs, which are going on now, this is a lot of train the trainers. So train the teachers, have the teachers go to the schools. 
good leveraging. You got about 40 teachers being trained. They touch, I forgot the number, but thousands of, of students. Um, our college and continuing education programs with DLIR, also uh, Kanu Kupu with their uh, EPA grant has uh, done, with, uh, what do you call it, energy auditing course that they're working with them to train auditors. Um, our business employee programs, again, all businesses have a great need to keep employees. And how do you keep them? You keep them happy. You keep them able to afford their electric bills. And so um, we're really working on that side of the house. And then I got the DLR on the bottom. So that was that. When we talk about what's important, this is a slide that shows a couple different things. And one highlighted is CFL residential. No matter how you cut it, all right, CFLs are by far the largest component of this program for now and into the new reasonable future, and also all programs, it's not just Hawaii. So that's important to know. Going down there, high efficiency water heating, uh, sorry, solar water heating. Solar water heating is an important part of the program. This year it's a little bit lower on the list only because ARA actually paid for a lot of the systems last year. So, but it is there, and there's lots of challenges with that. Challenges being landlord tenant, probably one of the biggest ones, or ownership of the products. So, that's there as far as, you know, what kind of people do we need? Trained solar people. I think Darren mentioned that earlier in his presentation. LED, 13. It's just showing the relative contribution of LED, okay, with its lifespan. This is basically on program energy for the life of the projects. So that's another one that we need to get up the list. We know it's there. We know there's high potential, but we need to push it up. Then the last one we have is that's one project. That's CO demand control ventilation for a parking garage. It's actually 1% of the whole program last year for business was a single project of CO control. So again, it's knowing what's important, what can move the needle, train the people, and get them done, okay? All right, so professionalism is knowing how to do it, all right? That's everybody here. Knowing when to do it. We've got the financial guys. There's the financial people. And then doing it, okay? There's a lot of projects out there, and we work with a lot of the, the contractors here, and we'll talk about it in a minute, that have a lot of great projects that they've already figured out what to do. They have proposed it, and the owners have never moved forward. So the when is kind of iffy. The when, I think um, somebody mentioned today, I think it was Robin, about the $100 plus dollar per barrel. That's kind of a good when. Highest rates ever. Uh, that's probably a good when. So it's, it's, the, it's really moving to the doing it part. And that's, I guess, goes to Rob's discussion. Rob's discussion of, of being a government entity to kind of help everything put together. That's really our job, is to kind of help the uh, doing it part. So one of it is retailers. We talked about CFL light bulbs, right? Really important. If you walk to this store, you look at that wall, is that intimidating? Yeah. You really need someone in there, hopefully that guy in the red jacket, that knows what you need, right? Knows how to use it and can sell it to you so you actually do it. You walk out of there with a light bulb. And so all these uh, retailers, again, are both not just our uh, CFL program, but also our appliance program. I don't know if you guys have gone to Sears, but guess what? They're really good at selling appliances. And so um, if you do that, you really, you know, the trained, again, workforce, salesmanship, salesmanship in the retail environment, also salesmanship outside of that. You know, we talk about energy industries with Brandon. I mean, that's what his job is, is to sell projects. And that's really what, which, what makes projects work. Uh, it's also been recognized by a couple organizations that they're starting to do energy sustainable sales training. So they have a lot of energy auditors, they have a lot of that kind of stuff, but now they're doing sales training because that's actually what makes projects happen. This is the slide that I've been told people's eyes glaze over, but I'm going to show it to you just for a second. On the very, very top, it's the stuff, the four things that actually save energy. Energy consuming equipment, you make that more efficient, you save energy. Building envelope, you make it more efficient, less heat goes in, you save energy. Maintenance, if you maintain equipment, it's made, it stays efficient for a longer period of time. And then operations, turn it off when you don't need it, turn it down when you don't need it, that saves energy. That's all the stuff, okay? The money for stuff which programs typically were in the past. The second layer is the end use behavior. That goes into the sustainability movement. That talks about, you could have a perfectly great office building, but if everybody wastes energy, leaves their monitors on, makes it 62 degrees, um, you know, does all that, you're not necessarily going to be doing the best you can. Then the rest of it is everyone else. By the way, here, Renew, Rebu Rebuild Hawaii, I, I left this off, but we're really at the bottom. We're in the kind of the, well, push for the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum this afternoon, same room. Um, those are the guys, and this, all these people, really, this is, when we talk about the community, I think Rob and talk about, 
These are all the individuals that make it happen, or try to make it happen. How many, people does it take to change, how many people does it take to change a light bulb? All those people. All right, so here's a, the last, uh, no, almost second to last. Wishes cost nothing unless you want them to come true. All right, who's that? Who can help change a light bulb? Wishes? Come on. It's so quiet. Oh, I see a hand. Who? No? All right. The financial community. I tell you, you can have all the best intentions in the world. If you don't have the money to implement them, <laughs> might not happen. Um, this one is the financial community that are participating in the hot water cool rates. These are the individuals that are giving very attractive, 0% and or very low interest loans for uh, water heaters. These are fixed rate loans, fixed term loans. They're very attractive compared to what previously was available in the marketplace that could have been called predatory type loans. The no interest down until you don't pay it back and it's 27% interest for the rest of your life. Um, and so really this, these are the guys that make things happen. All right. We're also working with the financial community. We got the, for a little while, DBIT will come up and talk about their programs that are coming on. But financial communities to help the business side make investments because that's also a challenge right now. So that's talking about light bulbs. Da -da 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 -da. Okay. The other one is, okay, now you got the money, right? You guys got to talk with the expertise. These are the people, these are the industry trade allies. We have over 500 industry trade allies that help promote the programs, sell to customers, um, and this is the list of them last year. Um, a great deal of them still are customer driven. Customers don't indicate that anybody helped them, but typically somebody did, but not always. Um, and then you've got f f the relatively familiar names in here. These are the individuals that they are, have a vested interest in making this happen. This is how they eat for a living, okay? So we talk about you know, motivation. The motivation is these guys need customers. And so we really are a place to get customers, technology, and the people to actually build it, the guy to actually screw in the light bulb, that's the joke, right? It takes one to screw the light bulb in, it takes everybody else to get that guy there. And so that's that. And the one thing that we can do as a program is provide them things that are valuable. Um, you saw a little bit earlier, we had the graph of the, of, the, um, of the homes, that's valuable, show Ken where his customers are and how big they are and potentially. We had that chart with all the office buildings showing kind of in relative terms where they are. Um, for this side, we're talking about making financial decisions. Well, what's the most important thing in making a financial decision for electricity? How much does it cost? We made this graph for our, uh, our um, uh, vendors uh, about, I don't know, three or four months ago. And you see that projection right there, the red line, the projection? Look where it's hitting right there. About 30 something cents. Guess where it's now? It's over that. So good job to us, but not the great result that we wanted there. All right, so the last one. If a person gives you his time, he can give you no more precious gift. That's it. So hopefully I did my minutes. Um, that's us. We've got our website here, and uh, we'll be here up front so you can call to us. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, at Ulupono, one of our, our uh, prime mission is to see if we can make Hawaii more self-sufficient by making investments in energy, in energy projects. You know, we are very concerned about energy security. And to that end, we've, you know, we, we just will announce um, last week an investment in um, our third biofuels um, 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 project. Um, and we are looking at several uh, projects in energy. But in, con in, in the discussions uh, with, uh, with our panelists, um, they, they mention a couple other uh, projects that we've uh, financed or uh, collaborated with, especially uh, Kanu Hawaii and, and Kupu. What, I, what I'm really intrigued with, though, is that you know you've heard three very diverse uh, presentations, all focusing on different ways to handle energy efficiency, and we've touched upon the need for policy. And Michael stated eloquently our need to address the financing issues. And I see, can, uh, I hope you can see that segues into two of the other uh, projects, um, well, two of the other panels for this afternoon. But uh, looking, looking through this wealth of information that I, that I picked up and I learned from, um, there are a couple of themes that I thought um, when, I, when I ask you guys, and well, actually the first one I'm going to ask you, um, you know, if, if you can all elaborate, what stops you from going on to the next level? You, got, you guys have done wonderful things, but what's, what's your major impediment? 
All right, we'll start with Roth. I think, uh, what's that? Oh, yeah. Thank you. I didn't even see the mic. Um, the, the question is, what stops you from going to the next level? And I think it's really, uh, in a way, uh, two things. It's um, collaboration with uh, the churches and uh, people's mindsets, you know, how they, their barriers to changing their behaviors. And, um, you know, it, there's no urgency sometimes in people's minds to do these types of things because things are, you know, inputs and outputs are meeting, you know, they got a job or their income's co coming in and, you know, uh, and I, I really, this goes to, I think, the social media aspect of why people do things. Why do people change their behaviors? And, you know, we think that people change their behaviors because of information or they change it because of facts or, you know, people don't really change their behaviors because of facts or information. They change their behaviors either because something's right in their face, they have an emotional response to it, or their friends are doing it. And so I think that this carrot mob uh, approach is a very collaborative approach that will, um, and I think we need more of this collaboration and peer pressure uh, uh, today from, from uh, you know, between, uh, between us. Well, I think um, the quick answer would be time of the day. There's only 24 hours or so. But um, the other one is, I think, when you talk about the open the eyes, it's the creativity part. I think, you know, being able to see things differently is, is really probably the biggest restriction in, in, in our business, I think. Mm. Right now I'm thinking of that graphic that you made with the fourth sector, and I think one thing that could help us move forward is really creating a need for that fourth, fourth sector, and that's one of the things that we're trying to do at KYA Sustainability Studio is um, create a way where um, businesses can start filling that need. So it's all about, you know, who, who needs it right now? How do we um, identify the people um, that would be good prototypes for building that, that fourth sector? You know, one, one complaint I have about your carrot mob um, thing was that I spent so much time looking for a parking space. <laughs> I probably used more gas than, than any. And I ended up driving away and drinking my own wines, for God's sake. <laughs> um, your, your model, Sean, of e-collaboration, of, of bringing people together touches upon one of your last points and you, you, we all talk about you know you've all talked about bringing people together or you know what who's in the so my question is who's in the room who who does the inviting who does the convening mm -hmm. um, and what I, I wanna wanna you know pose to the broader group is that you know talk is cheap you know um, or as um, Mike put wishes cost nothing okay if we're going to make some movements towards energy efficiency, there's some pretty bright people uh, in this room and some wonderful people up here. Who's going to convene them? What forums are we talking about? What's, what's it really going to take to get to the next level? Hmm. Um, wow, good questions. I would say in our experience working with our, our client, um, the airport, it really takes people who are passionate and who really are invested in making Hawaii a better place uh, as, as just a main foundation. Because um, really, when it comes down to it, um, with sustainability, it's, there's so many different perspectives that are coming to the table at once that um, in fi finding that common ground, uh, it all comes from that passion. And um, uh, in terms of what the studio is trying to offer in terms of e-collaboration is providing that leadership in terms of um, who is it to hold that center to pull all these people together? Um, and it really depends on what their needs are um, based on you know, their, their particular organization and whatnot. So. I think um, that's been kind of the one thing. So you always hear everyone want to be the, the clearinghouse for energy efficiency, the one place to go to, the one website that links to all others. Um, and I'm not sure if that's ever going to happen. Um, Right now, when we do our you know, education things, it's actually kind of like, I think, to Rob's point, you can put as many facts on the website as you want, but that's not going to drive behavior. I think you know, anybody can type energy efficiency into Google and get more information than they ever want ever in the history of planet Earth. Um, but I think when we talk about Sean, it really is it's getting the people interested. It's getting them in the room. And this is a great forum right here, I think, you know, as, as Brandon said. We're changing this thing. I mean, as of the last meeting in the second, this is only a second meeting of this kind of a changed environment. And it's actually, you know, kind of representative now. We've got 
the people that are watching um, on the online video, that's new. That's different. We're reaching a lot more people that way. It's actually pod saved, so people see it afterwards. They don't have to drive here and look for parking. Um, and so I think it's just going to take a lot of little stuff. There's no one, one people. Um, the other thing, just plug for our bosses, uh, the commission is actually have what's called an energy efficiency portfolio standard uh, docket going on right now. And that's to at least talk about the government part of it. What part of government, it's the how much, the 4,300 gigawatt hours, who, when, you know, what kind of investments are going to go in there. So that's going on right now. So if you're interested, come see us. We'll let you, you know, all the gory details. Um, so, yeah, that's my thing. Well, I, my answer is a little bit different. I, I really think it's going to take leadership. Uh, and I don't mean leadership from leaders. I do mean leadership from leaders, but not just leadership from leaders. It's going to take leadership from every one of you. It's going to take leadership from us all. We're all scouts out there surfing this new wave that's coming. We see the change. We see the vision of the change. But we need to be leaders and we need to be passionate in my view, I, I volunteered in the last 20 years, I probably volunteered 50% of my time because I am so passionate about having a better world for our children. And that's what motivates me is the, the, I look at the future and I look at what's coming and I say, I'm not so sure that our children are going to be safe. And, and, and so what motivates me is this, this sense that I can do something and that I have a certain capability to do something. And I think in, within all of you, you have that too. And it's going to take leadership, and it's going to take money from organizations that have it, that are in place to seed the community. And it's going to take a partnership again between us all. I just wanted to add one more thing to that um, point about leadership. Um, especially for us sustainability professionals, really um, also coming together to identify what um, that leadership is going to mean because leadership is a really yeah, like, yeah. broad idea so you know in terms of our role as sustainability professionals working with these passionate people you know what does that mean maybe it means a little bit um, more on the listening side like listening to what these people mean learning how to demonstrate um, you know through the work that we're doing so um, I think that's a really good point good good points guys um, you know and as we as Mike as you talk about the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum meeting you know, this week we also have the meeting of the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative Steering Committee. We have the meeting of the Hawaii Economic Development Task Force. We're very good at meetings. So the question becomes where actually, you know, it's, a, it's, it's almost a rhetorical question, where's the leadership for all of this? And I, I really enjoy your answers. Um, it's a great time to invite questions from, from the audience, you know, and please ask you to weigh in. And as I say that too, for those of you online, you can, you know, please feel free to email your questions to hawaiienergy at saic.com. So please, anyone. <laughs> okay, so you're asking us to be prognosticators, and it's a good question. What's the price of oil going to be in 2030? <laughs> well, in, in my dream world, I would say that it wouldn't matter because we wouldn't be needing it anymore, but that's just me being overly oh, crazy. <laughs> we'll just leave that there. That's a good one. Good job. <laughs> yeah. But maybe you can give a more realistic answer. <laughs> So let's see. So what um, the, the proposal is? What would be the case if um, the price of oil in inflation adjustment drops to eighty dollars a barrel? Would that change energy policy? I think that's sort of the in, in inherent substance of your question. Well, I don't think that the price should be the driver for what we're doing. Uh, is it the driver for what we're doing? Yeah. For some some of us, it is. For some of us, it isn't. And I, I understand your point of view that it's from the business end, perhaps from the policy end, perhaps it's the price. And my concern is the development of the fourth sector where we have to make it not about just the price, but about doing the right thing for the future. And that's my main concern. And that doesn't answer your question, sorry. <laughs> well, I think 
actually that, that sparked a thing. Um, it's not necessarily the price. If you knew that oil would be $80 next year or say $110 or 120 your business could figure it out. You reprice your items and then you can maintain your business, you're fine. A lot of AOA condos have the electricity built into their, their association fees, which are set once a year. And so what's happened is it's been volatile. They say, hey, let's add 10% to it, let's look at it. And in the first four months, it's not 10%, it's 30. They don't have the actual cash to pay it. They postpone maintenance. They, for the whole year, are negative. They don't go for their special assessment. They have those kind of problems. They get financial trouble. In 2008, the $140 per barrel, there's a lot of businesses that are long, no longer here because they couldn't move fast enough with their rates. If you looked at plate lunch prices, yeah, it's, it, the, the electricity prices are in there. Um, and that's um, uh, the fact that electricity right now is more expensive than ever. In 2008, it was a crisis. We've got that whole frog sitting in the boiling water thing going on. And everyone here today is paying way more than they were in 2008 and still their business is fine. So to your point, you will adjust, you will adapt. Uh, the other part of the reason why we're here is the economy. The state's economy is very heavily dependent on the for foreign fossil fuels. Even though it may not you know, be $80, maybe you can't get it. And so that would be a whole other animal. And so. So as we look towards energy efficiency, of certainly the you know, mass scale would involve dealing with apartment owners. So how best to take an imperfect AOAO law, improve it, or what else do we need to do? It's a policy issue, it's a financing issue, and perhaps it's something that um, will be discussed in other sessions, but does anybody want to? Yeah, I, I, I want to address that because it brings up this idea of uh, policy instruments or what, what do we have at our disposal to um, kind of uh, persuade people to make the right choice. And one of those instruments is, uh, you know, policy. And that's what you were talking about. The policy is ineffective. But we also have moral suasion. And this is where nonprofits come into play, because they are out there every day talking to their community. And so I, that's why I would say I would urge you to, um, uh, maybe not you in your case, but I, uh, policymakers and uh, businesses and other, to use nonprofits as a way to um, educate your communities so that then they can complete the loop with their government officials and all, uh, so that policy can be crafted more effectively. You, that was for your association, your housing association? Well, the, well, the first thing that came to mind was I wonder what the organi organizational structure of that um, of the association is, and maybe it's something where that association actually needs um, a sustainability program of sorts to educate the people that are actually running the association. I mean, that may include um, like a series of guidelines that would you know be about implementing sustainability, a series of like policies. Like,
Right. <laughs> and I know Bob. Bob's not that kind of guy. Um, <laughs> Right. I think that's actually the case in point. We talked about um, the AOAOs a little bit earlier, and the, just some experience that we have. A lot of these master metered AOAOs, if they've got electric bill and they, everybody gets their share of the electric uh, cost, that doesn't motivate individuals to take action. And because I talked about to Rob's point, um, it also uh, there has been some illustrations of how that changes. You talk about the power. You talk about the board. Um, we've been working with one condominium for just under two years now. They were trying to get sub meters put in their building. They had to put it up to a vote. So they put it to the vote. They, their lawyer said 67% is what you need. They got 67% after a long process um, and nasty letters about how it's going to make the world fall apart. Um, and then the lawyer said, oh, you know what? Actually, we never passed that. We never passed that. So it actually, it's supposed to have been 76%. So back to square one. So a year later, they just, as of last month, or actually, what month is this? So yeah, last month. They uh, did a couple things in the past year. One, they voted out the board. We talk about individual leadership. They voted out the board. They, they're completely different now. Um, they uh, also redid the vote with a lot of education. They did bring in the vendors. They brought in ourselves. They brought in um, uh, Blue Planet, I believe, in that one, uh, to come in and kind of do that, that influence, that moral suasion. And now, you know, they're actually asking us now, can we hurry up? and they would like to have it installed by January. And so it takes two years, vote, and get it done in a month. So sometimes it just takes, like you said, what is it, the barriers? Time, sometimes. Mm. Okay, that was very good discussion and a problem that's gonna take a long time and probably other panels to resolve and hopefully we can address it with the policy group. Um, but we should, we should wrap this one up so we can proceed with uh, the other very useful and informative panels that are to follow. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panelists, thank you for keeping your presentations as coherent and, and, and concise as that is. And hopefully, you know, I, I know I've learned a lot and I hope you have too. Um, so with that, thank you for being such an rapt audience. We're just gonna take a brief break. So if everyone can be back at 10.15, we'll reconvene for session number two.